so much. All right, you ask a question. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, all right, so we're going to talk GI drugs. Uh, here's we're, we're, it's going to be you know like decently uh, high level. Let's see. There's my clicker working. Uh, basically, what I want you to be able to do is recognize these common drugs uh, when uh, when you see them on a patient's chart and know that they're for a GI condition. Uh, and then you kind of describe the effects they should have based on their kind of basic mechanism of action. And we'll talk about potential side effects of drugs and try to emphasize any side effects that have direct implication on uh, uh, on your work as, as general hygienist. So um, that's kind of the, the goals of today's uh, talk. So the uh, four kind of disease states that we're going to cover are kind of the most common GI complaints that patients have. Uh, and so one is, first is PUD. Anybody know what PUD stands for? Yes, nailed it in one. <laughs> Nicely done. Peptic ulcer disease is, uh, is our first one. You don't have to have candy if I'm pushing it on you. If you're like stronger than I am, you can say no and I'll just think you're... You're strong-willed and better than me, but that's cool. Um, next up is GERD, G-E-R-D. Anybody want to take a stab at that one? Yes, yeah, gastro reflux disease. Yeah, yeah, close. Gastroesophageal <laughs> reflux disease. You're so strong already. <laughs> um, GERD, so gastroesophageal just meaning stomach contents are coming up into the esophagus, uh, which is our our tube over here, the big orange one. Uh, so stuff comes from the stomach up the tube into the throat and, and all the way up to the mouth potentially. Uh, and then we'll also talk constipation and diarrhea, which is kind of at the other end of the human tube. We're basically just one squiggly tube from mouth to rear end. So um, we've got uh, constipation and diarrhea are mainly issues arising in the colon, which is the big green chunk of uh, goody stuff on here. Uh, colon's main job is to dry out the stool and reclaim water so we don't get dehydrated. If it does the job too good, you get constipation. If it doesn't do its job well enough, you get diarrhea. Um, and so we'll kind of talk a little bit about that as well. You guys talked about the basic anatomy a little. What is the small intestine? If the big, large intestine reclaims water, keeps us from dehydrating, what does small intestine do? The gets the nutrients, right? It gets all the good stuff out of our food uh, and uh, gets every bit of delicious sugar from the candy bars I'm giving out. Uh, so let's start talking about peptic ulcer disease or PUD. Um, what, do you, what do you guys think of when you think of ulcers? What are some kind of common causes you hear about? Spicy food. Spicy food. I know. Spicy food can irritate. Uh, what else? Alcohol. Alcohol. I heard alcohol. What were you going to say? H. pylori, good. Someone's looked ahead on the slides or it's just really knowledgeable already. You got it. Who said alcohol over here? Nice. What else do you guys hear? Anything else? Stress. stress. That's the one I was looking for. Oh, God. Who said stress? We yeah, we everybody's, everybody's ulcer prone in this room. Uh, so, yeah, those are exactly right. So, H. pylori is an infection that is. Um, is usually in about 90, up to 90% of ulcers that people have. And there are all these risk factors you guys talk about, spicy food and alcohol and stress, those can all lead to sort of a thinning of the mu mucus layer in the stomach that protects it from the acid that the stomach itself produces. Uh, and so when that mucus layer gets thinned out and acid directly contacts the cells of the stomach, it irritates, it eats away at those cells, it can form a hole or an ulcer, or a, more of a pit, rather. If it becomes a hole, you got a big problem because you got a hole through your stomach and you're spilling stomach acid into your guts, and that's never a good thing. Um, but an ulcer is painful and uh, unpleasant. It bleeds into the stomach, and, um, and for whatever reason, that, that bacteria is, uh, is a culprit in a lot of these. It causes increased irritation and issues with like, you know, the, um, that lining of the, of the stomach and such. And so you know, we found that if we can treat that, and that bacteria, it helps reduce the, um, the ulcer formation and all that good stuff. So let's kind of talk, uh, so we mentioned symptoms of pain. Uh, the tricky thing with ulcers is they can kind of come and go and there can be weeks or months in between, um, 
in between flare ups, basically. Uh, so people can, you know, they might put up with it for a little bit. It starts getting bad. And just when they're about to go to the doctor, it starts getting better. And they're like, ah, okay, well, moving on to something else. You forget about it. Uh, but it can kind of cause like, you know, slow uh, issues over time. You, with the, the thing we're really worried about is perforation, which is what that bottom picture shows where there's like, a, there's a small hole that goes all the way through the stomach. Uh, and, in, and you don't want acid going into your, uh, into your internal organs and your, uh, your abdominal cavity. So that's a big emergency. Usually people uh, are in a lot of pain before that. So they're going to come in for help and, and we can avoid those worst outcomes. But um, anything that's like, that gets real bad, we can, we consider that a complication. So a side effect is like a not good outcome of something, uh, but a complication is really bad. Uh, and so we want to really avoid those. Uh, and that's the, that's hemorrhage, which is bleeding into the stomach. Uh, and the symptoms of that uh, are black tarry stool. What do, what, what does tarry mean? Black, like a, or like sound. Sticky. Sticky, like a tar, like tar. What, I'm sorry, what was the word you said? Was it like more of a sandy? Oh yeah, it could be sandy, kind of gritty, but also like sticky tar, like, like think of like oil tar, like black tarry oil, like the La Brea tar pits or something like that. Um, that where does that black color come from? Blood. 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 It's from the blood. So what is, what is the, what's in blood that's can make it? Blood's red, right? Why is it black? When we, it comes out the other red end. Red cells? Red blood cells. What's in red blood cells? Yeah. Heme. Heme and heme's made out of? You want to you you want to pump a lot of this, and you want to iron, 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 right? What happens when iron rusts? It turns dark color, right? That's rusted iron in your uh, in your that's what the old blood that's broken down and it's oxidized. So basically, you're pooping rust, and it looks black, and it's no no good. That's not a that's that's a, that's a negative complication. Another one is um, pyloric stenosis, which is a fancy word that talks about um, uh, issues with the, the pyloric sphincter, which are these openings on either end of the stomach. Uh, you can have issues with those where uh, it won't let, it'll like kind of spasm and clench up and it won't let food go through and stuff like that. So that's another bad thing we want to avoid. So let's kind of see, this is a nice little video, just a, minute, a couple minutes long, kind of shows us how things can break bad in the stomach. Um, when it comes to ulcers and such. The stomach plays a key role in digestion, breaking down food by producing a strong acid. Protecting itself from the harsh effects of this acid, the stomach maintains an unstirred mucus layer that protects the stomach lining. The balance between the protective mucus layer and the strong acid, along with other factors, helps to keep your stomach healthy. The mucus layer is produced within the stomach lining mainly by small cells called goblet cells. Stomach acid is produced by parietal cells and released into the stomach by many tiny acid pumps that are parts of these cells. Certain pain medications such as ibuprofen, naproxen and aspirin travel through the body in blood vessels. When these medicines, called NSAIDs, or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, are released in the stomach lining, they cause the goblet cells to decrease production of mucus. Reduction of mucus may cause the protective barrier to become thin, allowing the strong stomach acid to come into direct contact with, and in some cases cause damage to, the stomach lining. This damage can sometimes lead to an ulcer. Some ulcers can lead to serious medical problems, like bleeding and stomach blockage. If you're taking certain pain medications, such as ibuprofen, naproxen, or aspirin, on a continuous basis, talk to your doctor or health. Okay, so that was actually one of the risk factors we didn't mention when we were talking ulcers is, is NSAID use. So ibuprofen, uh, naproxen, uh, aspirin, those kind of things. Uh, because those do minimize, like reduce that mucus layer, which opens up the stomach to, to attack. This video didn't really talk about H. pylori, but we still know it's a, it's a factor. So let's go ahead and talk about medication. So H. pylori being a big culprit in uh, contributing to this ulcer formation, um, we can test to see if it's 
present in somebody. In most cases, in people with ulcers, it is. So we treat it with a combination of antibiotics and some antacids uh, that are pretty strong. So you use a couple antibiotics, like amoxicillin, clarithromycin are kind of the standard. Uh, but if somebody has like a penicillin allergy, so they can't take amoxicillin, we can switch it up to like metronidazole or and tetracycline. Uh, and then there is a prescription antacid that goes along with it, like a lanzoprazole or a meprazole. We'll talk about those in a, in a few minutes, but those are, uh, those are real strong uh, anti antacids that, sh that um, shut down acid production and they're now available over the counter. Yeah, question. Uh, what is continued use? Is that a couple times a month? Is that a couple times a week? Is that every day? Uh, it's it's usually kind of like long-term use. So the, the, the question was about continued use of NSAIDs leading to ulcer formation. Um, it's, a, it's, it's usually long-term sort of use over the period of weeks and months. Uh, and so for someone that's maybe like, you know, taking it for arthritis pain or some like back pain or something that's like kind of a chronic pain condition and they're self-treating with an, uh, with an NSAID or even treating under the, with prescription strength NSAIDs and things like that. Um, anybody that's on those kind of long-term weeks and months, we want to uh, warn them about the symptoms of ulcers and just tell them to keep an eye out if that happens and they can be dealt with. Um, it usually, you know, if you're taking it for like a headache or a cold or whatever, and you take a few days worth, that's usually not, not enough to make much of a difference unless you're already really at risk due to lots of other risk factors and stuff. Good question. What other questions y'all have? Yeah. But did you say something was available over the counter? Yeah, um, most of the products we're gonna talk about today are over the counter. Uh, so these lanzoprazole and omeprazole are both uh, strong proton pump inhibitors that like here's some, here's some lanzoprazole from Target and some omeprazole from someplace called Good Sense. So these were prescription up until, you know, 10, 15 years ago, and now you can get them over the counter. The, the uh, over the counter use is limited to two weeks uh, by the labeling. So if somebody needs to use them for more than two weeks, they should probably see their doctor to make sure they're not like masking the symptoms of an ulcer or something that can't be treated with over the counter products. So um, the, this little combo pack though of antibiotics and the antacids can really uh, lead to real fast healing rates in, a, in two weeks or less. So and then sometimes we'll also add bismuth subsalicylate on, which is, anybody know the brand name for bismuth? Pepto, yeah, the pink stuff. It tastes delicious. That is it. Yes, question. I just wondered, I think we might have a gold power play. It's talking about the H4, I didn't know, seven. Oh, yes. Okay, so, yeah, so uh, I, I apologize. I thought, good point. I updated uh, the date range to 10 to 14 days. They've, they realized a week isn't usually enough in most cases. So the newest guidelines say 10 to 14 days for this. Thanks for pointing that out. Sorry, I thought I sent the, let's not hit save when I was updating. I think I, I need to, I think I put up an older version. So I'll, I'll make sure the new one goes up. Oh, okay. That might be my fault. Yeah. I mean, I did add some stuff to this year's slide set. So it is okay. going to be different. So. so I'll update it after class. Sounds good. Stay tuned for the fresh <laughs> off, uh, off the presses version. So here's Pepto, business subsalicylate. Um, that's our, uh, our friend Pepto here. And if you guys wanna look at a Pepto bottle, you can pass them around. Um, but good old Pepto is it's indicated for mild diarrhea uh, and you can also use it for uh, H. pylori infections. Um, it kind of decreases secretions um, and uh, it also has some antimicrobial action, so they think that might be why it kind of helps with this or with H. pylori as part of that regimen. Uh, one of the side effects is this black stool or black tongue. It's harmless, but gross. It usually just scrapes right off and you can rinse the mouth out and get rid of it. But uh, this is the medication oxidizing and rusting essentially like in the, uh, in the mouth. And so it looks similar. You get a black stool, which kind of makes people worry about blood in the stool, but it looks different. It's not black and tarry and it's not gritty, uh, sandy. Um, it just turns a darker color. So, um, so it is harmless, but can be freaky. Uh, another potential issue you can run into with bismuth is uh, RISE syndrome or RAISE syndrome. I can't remember which way it's supposed to. Anybody heard of that or know anything about that? You, re you recognize it? What, what do you think of when you hear RISE syndrome? Um, Tylenol. Uh, so Tylenol, so there's 
Um, it's it's usually with NSAIDs. Uh, so bismuth is like um, is related to things like aspirin and um, and. Okay. I missed anybody, just put your hand up as I'm wandering around, or put your hand out and you grab it from the bucket. Um, the, uh, the NSAIDs, uh, or actually salicylates in particular, things like aspirin and bismuth subsalicylate have um, this potential to cause Rye syndrome, which is a weird issue that generally happens in kids and it's when they take salicylates following a viral infection so if someone's got like a cold or something um it can cause uh and they take a salicylate around it then they can get this rise syndrome which is like which is pretty nasty uh and it's it's thankfully very rare but when it happens it's no bueno so would you recommend if someone is taking like how to take this in combination or ibuprofen like if you have to take ibuprofen and would it help if you take that with it? Oh, it's like a protective or, type thing? Yeah. Um, so the question was, if could you take ibuprofen? Or if you're taking ibuprofen, could you take Pepto as like kind of a protective type thing? I mean, not, um, you wouldn't, we don't normally recommend that uh, just because it's it's not usually necessary. Well, again, most people are taking ibuprofen on a short-term basis if they were having um, issues with, uh, with ulcer formation or symptoms, then we would... The Pepto is just kind of an add-on treatment on top of that stuff we looked at on this previous slide, because um, that's the, if, if they're having actual ulcers, Pepto alone is not going to cover it. So I don't think so. You can just they're bugging you back. You can shove them on the side, and I'll get them later. Unless you want an excuse to come visit. Let's see. Well, yeah, so rise syndrome, thankfully very rare, but this is why you don't see aspirin used in kids. We always default to Tylenol or acetaminophen or ibuprofen. We stay away from aspirin because we don't want to cause rise syndrome. All right, so as far as peptic ulcer disease is concerned, a couple of um, considerations from a dental hygiene perspective. Um, you can ask him, you know, if they, if they report that they have ulcers, um, you can ask him about, uh, you know, symptoms and they're having any GI pain. One thing I kind of glossed over it earlier, but if they have really bad ulcers, they could be vomiting from the pain and from the, the issues that around the stomach. So that could, that's never fun uh, when someone's in a chair and growing up. So uh, potentially raising the head of the chair into a semi supine position is recommended to increase patient comfort. And you're going to see that recommendation for pretty much everything GI related uh, today. You'll see that word drop up a lot. But that's what we're kind of looking for. Any questions on ulcers before we change gears and talk about GERD? Yeah. So if we have a patient that's got like really bad reflux disease and mm. they're getting like erosion of the mouth, are they more likely to get ulcers like through their throat? Yeah, so the question was about if you've got someone with reflux disease and it's causing dental erosions, are they at more risk for ulcers? Uh, they can be, um, but almost... Not necessarily ulcers in the stomach, but they could have ulcers in the esophagus from yeah. issues of, uh, of uh, acid uh, wearing down the, the tissue lining in the esophagus. Um, so that's definitely very, uh, very possible. Um, we are going to talk today. So as far as GERD, it's big thing happens because of reflux through uh, our, our friend Les here, the lower esophageal sphincter. It's basically the the hole right at the top of the stomach where between the esophagus and the stomach. Um, that is like a, a little constricting orifice that uh, should be squeezed shut when we're uh, at most times. But if, it, if things cause it to relax, stomach contents can get pushed up uh, and out of the stomach and get up and reflux into the esophagus. And you get this backup of stomach juice, which as we know is very acidic. Uh, and that goes into these stuff into, up into the esophagus and can make it all the way into the mouth. And it's in real bad cases can be causing dental erosion and things like that. Uh, a lot of things contribute to reflux. Uh, it's more common after meals, especially when the stomach's full, which makes sense. You've got stomach's kind of like a balloon. So if you fill it with a bunch of stuff, it's more likely to squeeze out. Uh, obesity causes pressure on the stomach, which can increase uh, reflux. Nicotine relaxes our little friend less, uh, so it doesn't do its job as well. You can get hernias that create little pouches with acidic contents um, that can that can kind of squeeze out and, and, and cause issues. And then pregnancy. Why, why would pregnancy be a problem? Well, then she all the organs. 
Fresh to the little bun in the oven is squeezing the stomach, right? It's pushing everything around in there and, and more pressure so it can, it can reflux up. Uh, there's other kind of factors that contribute, but those are kind of some of the more, more common things. Um, it's, you know, everybody's had like heartburn before in mean, most cases where you're like, you get that, that pain in the, uh, in the chest after eating and, and the, getting that occasionally is fine. It's when that happens a lot um, and to where you're getting, you know, issues in the throat and, and mouth, that's, that's when it's uh, real bad. So that symptoms of, of that, what they call substernal, so it's below the sternum, which is on your chest, uh, and it's pain that generally radiates upwards. If you take an antacid, it, it relieves the pain because it deals with those symptoms right away. Um, and it's usually worse when you're lying down. So people can have problems when they're sleeping at night uh, and they can have reflux at night and not really realize it, but just have poor crummy sleep as a result. Um, it's bad when you're bending over. This is obviously an image of uh, dental erosions, which is a complication. Uh, as you all know, when you lose tooth, um, Enamel. Enamel and volume. Uh, I'm to, there's a word I'm, that's escaping me. But when you start losing your tooth uh, material, it doesn't come back, right? So when it's gone, it's gone. And so it's best to, when you start noticing issues with erosion, to deal with it then, um, to try and uh, prevent issues like we're kind of seeing here. I actually was just in for my clean a week or so ago, and my hygienist is like, Do you have hurt? And I was like, well, Not really. I'm like, <laughs> I did go on a trip to Alaska with some friends and there was a lot of food and drink and I was had real bad reflux that night as I was sleeping on a mattress on the ground <laughs> at my buddy's house. Uh, I'm like, maybe that's it. She's like, yeah, I can see a little like whatever. So she recommended that I start chewing in acid tablets periodically throughout the day, try to drink more water. Um, and I ended up like getting like a, like a sleep wedge because I came back from that trip and I was snoring uh, after not getting very good sleep for a few nights and my drive my wife nuts. So I bought a sleep wedge that showed up the next day and and that raised the head of my bed basically. And that helped my snoring and it'll, it'll probably help any reflux I get too if I decide to overeat. Do you sleep okay on the wedge? Is it comfortable? Uh, it's not as comfortable as not on the wedge, yeah. but I've gotten pretty used to it. It's it was, it's not a, it's like a, I don't know, 10 inch rise or something like wedge. that. It's not. Not huge, but I figure, I don't know, I'll stick with it and uh, we'll see how it goes for a while. But um, anyhow, the other things you can get, you can get you know issues with asthma because the reflux can go up and actually irritate. Uh, it can go into the lungs a little bit and irritate that. And, and over time, you have the potential for oral cancer and things like that. So we definitely want to avoid all that if possible. Yeah. For the like oral cancer, is that just because the cells are trying to turn over so quickly? Yeah, it's like continuous damage to the to the mucosa, and uh, you know, more the more times you damage tissue repeatedly, the and it's healing itself, the more chances you have for something to kind of break in the in the regeneration process and get out of control and grow wild like a cancer. So exactly. Uh, so this is this is a slide that's probably going to look a little different than yours because I added a few things. Um, one thing that was added is Zegarid is like a, a, a proton pump inhibitor that's basically it's not really a new one, but it's a it's a combination of a proton pump inhibitor with an antacid. Uh, so it's sort of like a co it's a combo product essentially. But there's sort of three main categories or classes of drugs uh, that work for um, for this issue. Proton pump inhibitors are the big guns. Those are the most potent ones, the ones that were prescription until relatively recently. Uh, they are heavy duty, they work relatively quick and they're super effective. Um, the antacids are real fast acting, but kind of short term acting. Uh, so they provide immediate relief, but not for very long. And then the H2 receptor antagonists are kind of in the in-between. They they're pretty effective and they provide relief over the period of you know, multiple hours, um, but, uh, but they're not quite as potent as the proton pump inhibitors. We'll kind of talk about these uh, one by one. And um, the proton pump inhibitors, these work by irreversibly shutting down that acid pump in the stomach lining. So those in that video we watched, those are the little green uh, looking things that, the, it, that were making the acid. The proton pump inhibitor goes, binds to that pump and 
and grabs on and doesn't let go, which is fairly, which is not a very common in the, in the drug world. Usually in the drug world, you can think of a drug as like, like a key that goes and works on some kind of lock in the body and turns things on or off. Uh, usually the, the drug will stick around in a, drug, in a receptor, the lock being kind of like a drug receptor in the body. Uh, and drugs generally go into those receptors, hang around for a little bit until they eventually fall off. And they have a drug action that we want uh, while they're connected to the receptor. In the case of, a, of these proton pump inhibitors, they stay in the lock and get jammed in there and never come out. So it shuts down that pump permanently uh, which means that that pump doesn't make acid for the re remainder of its, of its life cycle, which in the stomach, the cells are turning over pretty frequently because uh, even with the mucus layer and all that, your stomach is sloughing off old cells and making new ones to replace it. So your, const your stomach's constantly making new acid pump cells and all that stuff. So we have to keep taking the drug on a daily basis to keep, have it keep working. But the reason these are so effective at reducing acid levels is because they're shutting down those pumps uh, permanently. They also have very low side effects. The only thing that, that might come up from a high, uh, dental hygiene perspective is xerostomia or taste perversion, but that's in less than 1% of patients. And I'm, um, so they're not very common, basically. Questions on proton pumps before we talk antacids? <clears throat> Yes. I probably, you probably said this and I was just distracted, but do proton pumps, do we make more of them? So once, did yeah, you this, just say what, that to everyone? And I oh, it's all good. The, yeah, this, the stomach lining is constantly making okay. new cells and turning over old cells. Uh, they get sloughed off. And so that's why we take the medicine on a daily basis. So, it, you know, it shuts down a lot of the pumps in the stomach, but you're always making more. So you got to keep taking the medicine. But okay. Have it do its thing. Thank you. But it drastically... Uh, raises the pH of the stomach uh, or quite a bit so that you don't have, you know, even if you do reflux, then it's not the contents of the reflux are not as acidic and not as damaging to the esophagus and the mouth and all that stuff. Now, antacids, on the other hand, these are just pretty simple chemical compounds. They're, they're basic compounds. Remember acids and bases in chemistry class? What happens when you mix an acid in a base? makes water. Water. I didn't hear what you said, but I'm sure it was awesome, so you can't even. Uh, the, uh, the, oh, I forgot, to, I forgot to pass out goodies. Here, I'll pass out uh, you can see some examples. Of, these, are, these are some proton pump inhibitors you can kind of take a look at. Uh, when it comes to antacids, we've got, what did I bring today that are antacid -y? I've got some pep. Oh, that's my H2. Here's my antacids. We don't have a good, these are what I'm chewing now at the recommendation of my dental hygienist. So good old calcium carbonate. It's basically just chalk um, with a lot of sugar and some color added to it. So very simple products that are basic and chemically basic. And so when you chew them up and swallow them, they react with your stomach acid to form water. It raises the pH of the stomach. So it immediately it works really, really quick, basically. But once that amount that you've chewed up is, has reacted and has passed through, it's, it, it doesn't have any more effect. So it's a very short-term, short-acting effect. You're just neutralizing the acid itself. It has no effect on the acid-producing system of the stomach, any of that kind of stuff. You can get some either diarrhea or constipation, depending on the person's individual sort of makeup. Everybody's a beautiful snowflake and some get uh, one symptom and some get another. But uh, the other ones that kind of fall, the Pepto technically falls into this class and can, uh, can be used as an upset stomach reliever. Um, and then you've also got things like uh, Mylanta or um, Milk of Magnesia, which I've got some Milk of Magnesia, which you'll see uh, abbreviated as MOM or MOM if you're in like a hospital setting. Good old mom makes your tummy feel better. So um, when it comes to the last group, this is our H2 receptor. H2 is the histamine receptor. Um, so these histamine receptors basically uh, activate 
they act as um, as little switches to turn on acid production pumps in the stomach. And so uh, if you shut that receptor off with these medications, then it shuts down that acid producing pump, but it's only temporary. So this it works like most drugs do where it goes in, binds to a receptor, hangs around for a few hours and falls off. Uh, but for those few hours, you're not making that particular pump's not making acid. Uh, and so you're getting that that blocking. Pretty mild in the side effect uh, side of things as well. This product I have here is Pepsid, which is famotidine, one of the, which is an H2 receptor antagonist, but they also mixed it with some, and they call it complete, it's dual action. So they mixed it with an antacid. So you get that immediate relief that happens right away. And then the H2 receptor antagonist kicks in within about a half hour, an hour, and does its thing for, you know, four to six hours or whatever it is. And, uh, and they're chewable, which is cool. Uh, but there's basically four of these products you can get Tagamet, Zantec, Pepsid, and Axid all on the market. Most of them, all oh, these are all available generically as well. Um, to save your money, yes. So, for the PPI or the um, medications, yeah. are those for an everyday medications? And then, the yeah. are basically whenever you get them as needed, you can take them? Yes, great question. So, the, the proton pump inhibitors are once a day meds. You take them you just one time a day, one capsule or pill. Uh, the antacids you take kind of as needed. You can kind of take, in essence, as many as you want until you start getting constipated or diarrhea or whatever. Um, you're, if anything, you're getting extra calcium in your diet for strong bones and stuff like that. And then the uh, H2 receptor antagonists are usually taken, if you look at the, the box, it'll, I think it says every like six to eight hours or something like that. Yes. So which ones did you say we can take as many as we need? Antacids generally, so like rolling, uh, well, like the, the things like the Tums, the tablets, the roll aids you can kind of take as many of those as you want. These other ones, they do have kind of limits. You'll start getting, um, you know, diarrhea, constipation or issues if you're taking a lot of these. So there are limits to how many you can take of these, but the Tums, you can, you'll see people eating those like candy. Okay. I mean, anything too much can be no good. The, the, these tablets that you got there, the tablets and the acid, those are, those are probably the safest to take lots of. Um, but uh, you are going to get blocked up probably and constipated if you take too much. And so you, you'll, you'll reach a point where you don't feel good enough to keep <laughs> shoving them down your gullet. So. Uh, here's an example of a, like a diagram of one of those acid producing cells, the parietal cells that we uh, saw in the video. And there's this acid pump is this kind of swirly thing in the middle. It's pumping out hydrogen ions and then uh, it, it pumps hydrogen ions and then chloride ions sort of diffuse into the stomach and then they mix to form hydrochloric acid. Uh, and down below, you've got uh, the histamine receptor, which is helping turn this pump on. So if you've taken H2 receptor antagonist, it blocks that, turns off the pump temporarily. Uh, you've also got other receptors like acetylcholine for anticholinergics. Um, have you guys talked about anticholinergics yet? Yeah. A little bit, yeah. We have a limerick that's a little bit naughty in pharmacy. Uh, have you guys heard the limerick for a side effect from anticholinergics? Look, Limerick goes, you can't see, you can't spit, you can't pee, you can't shit. So <laughs> it's the anticholinergics are kind of shutting down like tear production, saliva production, urine production. Uh, they're also messing with, with acid uh, secreting cells and fun stuff like that. Uh, the, uh, the pump itself is, is bound up by the proton pump inhibitors. So they work directly on the pump. Uh, and then antacids are going to work out here and neutralizing the acid that's already been made. So let's do one more quick video uh, about <clears throat> proton pump inhibitors, and then we'll move on. The inner surface of the stomach is formed into numerous gastric pits from which acid is secreted. The cells lining the gastric pits are mucus neck cells, which secrete mucus, the G cells, which secrete gastin, the parietal cells, which secrete hydrochloric acid. The proton pump present in parietal cells is responsible for acid secretion. 
The proton pump is located in the luminal side of the parietal cell. Proton pump. Proton. Potassium. ATP. The proton pump actively transports protons into the stomach lumen and potassium back to the parietal cell with hydrolysis of ATP. Proton pump inhibitors are drugs which reduce acid secretion of the stomach. The drug binds irreversibly to the proton pump and prevents the active transport of protons. This dramatically decreases the acid secretion of the stomach. Magic. So proton pumps are cool for the most part. There was a little bit of uh, data showing if you take them real long term, might be not good in some other ways, but that's kind of how everything goes. So. Everything in moderation, as my wife says. Uh, dental hygiene considerations for GERD. Uh, again, that you want to check, ask them about chair position, semi-supine, raising the head of the, of the chair or your bed can help with GERD. So, um, and then if you get the, uh, you're seeing evidence of erosion, you might want to talk about how to minimize tooth destruction and uh, anti-carry stuff. So, uh, you know, chewing those antacids like my hygienist told me to do or drinking more water or, uh, be adjusting the, the diet. I did have GERD one time, like years ago, uh, and I thought I was having, I thought I had thyroid cancer because my mom had just been like diagnosed with it and had, like, had a, half her thyroid removed. And I got this lump in my throat when I was swallowing. I'm like, oh God, uh, this is not good. And then I go in and they scoped me. They look down and he's like, oh, you got GERD. He's like, your uh, esophagus is inflamed or whatever. He's like, you know, so no spicy food, no alcohol, no caffeine, no chocolate. I was like, what am I going to, that's everything I eat. I'm like, I don't know. You got a pill for this? And he's like, yeah, we do. So I took Omeprazole for a while. Um, and then I realized I probably could live with slightly less uh, chocolate and spicy food. So I managed to stop taking the Omeprazole. I took it for a couple of years, but anyway, uh, I need to probably work on it a little bit more, but doing what I can. I am using high fluoride toothpaste to sort of protect what I got. Um, so I got that going for me. Anyway, uh, real quick, let's do a little uh, mini case. So we got a new patient coming in, 55 year old, 5'6", 205 pound person, visiting day to get a cleaning. We got these four drugs on their chart. Uh, let's just take a minute or two, talk to uh, your table neighbor and figure out a couple questions you might want to ask this patient about their medications or med history. Questions are are you wondering about? Yeah. If they get dry mouth from any of their medications. If they get dry mouth from any of their medications, that would be good to know. What other kind of stuff? Yeah. And if they took it the day of the appointment, so we don't want to, you know, have those excessive. Yeah, exactly. Taking it the day of the appointment. So what what on here might uh, lead you to think they have issues with any of the disease states we've talked about so far? Yeah, they're taking omeprazole as a proton pump inhibitor. They got the tongs they're taking as needed. What's lisinopril for? High blood pressure. High blood pressure, that's right. Who said it? Somebody over here. Yes. Um, so that's high blood pressure. What is APAP? Anybody know what that's an abbreviation for? It's a weird abbreviation for... Tylenol or acetaminophen. I don't know why. I realized I put that in there. It's like a pharmacy abbreviation. So you probably wouldn't, the patient would just tell you they're on acetaminophen, but 
that's acetaminophen is needed for headache. So yeah, you wanna kind of ask about their, their control of whatever they're, they're, they might be taking the omeprazole and Tums probably for GERD or something, um, and, or just heartburn. So asking them, you know, if it's under control or not. All right, we got a, we got 20 minutes left. So I'm gonna pick up the pace a little bit. We got constipation. Lots of different things can cause constipation, but the bottom line is, things that cause the stool to move through the colon too slowly. And so the colon dries it out, dries out the stool more than it should. And it forms hard stool, it can eventually get blocked. Um, lots of disease states and problems can cause it, but so can diet, you know, <clears throat> low fiber diet, low, uh, low activity. The more active you are, the more your gut's moving and pushing things along. Um, just ask my dog who poops within 20 feet of our house every time we go on a walk. And I'm like, why couldn't you have done this like back in the yard? And, but no. Um, hydration is a big one. If you're not getting enough liquid in your diet, then your body is going to try extra hard to get all the liquid it can out of the stool to keep you from getting dehydrated. Uh, and then that'll cause constipation. And then lots of drugs cause issues with it. Usually the drugs slow down what they call peristalsis, which is the muscular movement. The colon is just one long, big, snaky tube thing, and it squeezes from one end to the other in these waves to kind of push stool through. And drugs can either decrease the force of that contraction or the amount uh, that it contracts, kind of the frequency. And those all add up to stool sitting in the colon, not moving things along. So your symptoms are your dry, infrequent, or insufficiently sized stool. You can feel like you still have to go to the bathroom even though you just did. You get bloating, flatulence, pain. If it gets real bad, you can get anorexia. Your body's like, doesn't, you don't feel hungry because your body's like, please, no more. You're just adding to the traffic jam down here. Um, and, and malaise, which is just a fancy word for feeling like crap and tired and, and everything. So uh, if, you get, if it gets really bad, you can lead to bowel impaction or bowel obstruction and in severe cases you have to go in and get de-impacted which can either be someone literally digging around in your business end get things moving and out of there or uh, it can even be surgery in real severe cases um, you can have problems with like we had a family friend whose little kid got constipated and it created this really bad uh, feedback loop where he didn't want to go to the bathroom because it hurt well, that made the constipation worse. So when he tried it, it hurt worse. And he ended up with like bowel control issues and he had to get like implants to like help uh, relax the muscles on certain schedules. And it became this whole thing. Um, so it can be, you know, best to, your prevention is the best medicine in a lot of cases. So staying hydrated, staying active, eating healthy. Um, and if you're, if you're like me and you like cheese too much, uh, which can lead to constipation, maybe you take some uh, psyllium capsules like I do to keep it moving along because I just can't stop eating cheese. So um, these are all, there's a lot of options for constipation. We got, and all of these are uh, over the counter products with the exception of these kind of three little guys in the bottom there, the prescription options, the RX options. Those are going to be new, not on the slide deck you guys have. Uh, these are really only used in extreme cases, people that have like real issues, with real bowel issues that are pretty severe. And I, I, these are very rarely prescribed. Most constipation issues can be treated with over-the-counter options because we've got a lot of them. But we'll talk briefly about them. So here's uh, psyllium or excuse me, bulk forming agents. They're, they're, psyllium is a type of plant and they take the husk of the plant which is a uh, uh, insoluble plant fiber that doesn't get absorbed in, into the bloodstream, but it stays in the intestines and it draws water to it and it swells up and adds bulk to the stool. So anything Metamucil, it comes, the powder can come in all shapes and sizes. You can get it in crackers and capsules and tablets and cookies and powders like this that I'm handing around that'll, um, that can, uh, you can take. But the problem is, since it is a plant-based fiber, your natural bacteria in your gut love to chew it up and can make some extra gas and you can get some cramping and stuff from that. Yeah. So would it kind of just be the same thing if you start eating super fibrous plant-based diet? Yeah. It, I mean, you could have some... Uh, that, this is why a high fiber diet basically works like this, where a lot of the... Uh, some of the fiber gets absorbed, but a lot of it stays in the intestine, draws water to it helps move, it gives the stool more bulk so it can kind of get pushed along. Uh, and then, and the stool that is pushed along doesn't dry out as much. It holds the water inside it better because of the, 
the insoluble plant fiber that's, that's in the gut. So this is basically a, a shortcut way to get some fiber in your diet. The problem is this can be, um, it's more of a better for prevention and, and for treating mild constipation. If you have severe constipation, you're just adding more to the, blood, to the backup, to the you know, traffic jam. So you want to be careful in that regard. Uh, you also want to take it with lots of water because it swells up by quite a bit in size and people have been known to choke on Metamucil products when they try to like <coughs> uh, eat a bunch of the crackers or something without staying hydrated and drinking it, washing it down. Emollients, emollients are the other, um, are another type. And these are basically like soaps, uh, essentially, that you can eat. And they increase the mixing of fats and uh, water in the stool to kind of soften. They're, they're termed stool softeners, you'll see a lot of times. And docusate is, a, is the most common one. Um, so that's what we got here. Docusate is like, um, it's usually used in a preventative fashion. Uh, you, you might see it, especially when people are given like a narcotic uh, pain medication. Take a stool softener along with, along with the narcotic just to prevent constipation because nar narcotics slow that um, peristalsis and the squeezing of the large intestine. So the stool sits around longer and gets dry. That's how, that's how um, narcotics, you know, your Percocets and your hydrocodones and all that stuff cause uh, constipation. Um, stool softeners are not super effective uh, for treatment, so they're, they're a little better on the prevention side, but uh, they can be used. Here's saline osmotics are kind of the big guns when it comes to constipation in, um, in, in the world. The magnesium citrate is what's in this clear glass bottle, so careful with this one, it's glass. But mag citrate is sort of like, if you haven't pooped in, in several days and you really want to go, this is what we go to. Oh, and they also, they also make enemas uh, out of uh, saline enemas, like a fleets uh, type thing. Um, what they do is it's like, it's a, it's an uh, a non-absorbable salt that again stays in the intestine and it draws lots of water to it. Uh, so this is basically, you drink, with this bottle, what I tell people is you can have it, drink like half the bottle and be ready to go because it was going to kick in within like half hour to an hour and you're going to have to go fast. So you, you drink need your, half this bottle, that's the dose? Yeah, half that bottle. If that doesn't do it, you drink the other half and then hold on tight because it's going <laughs> to go on real fast. <laughs> yeah, so good question. So the question was, uh, is this the kind of thing they use for colonoscopies? Essentially, yes. Um, it's a, Colonoscopies is... Saline osmotics, but also can be um, like a Miralaxy type thing, but it's essentially a, a saline osmotic. Um, they use a lot of times a polyethylene glycol mixture for colonoscopies, which is what we'll talk about in, in, uh, on the in upcoming slide. But saline osmotics can be used as well. The, the problem with saline osmotics is they're so potent and it only takes like that bottle to clear most people out. And when it, with the colonoscopy, they wanna push a lot of volume through to really flush everything out. So they have you drink like a gallon jug or something of, of oh stuff gosh. to really, really just ream you out. Um, when it, this, this type of product should not really be used. It's pretty nasty stuff as evidenced by the laundry list of side effects. Uh, it's literal oil and it's mineral oil, which means it comes from an inorganic source. So this is like oil out of the ground that you would put in a car or something, Why but it's been around a long time uh, and it's still on the market as an option, but it's, it literally just lubes up your stool and helps it slide through. And the problem is you can like, you're, it's, you're drinking oil out of the ground and your body can be like, that's not natural. I don't want this in my body. You get a foreign body reaction. You can, if you, accidentally in, inhale some, it can cause a lipid pneumonia where it breaks down the surfactant layer in the lungs and you can like have like horrible issues with that. Um, it can mess with any vitamins of absorption that you're taking at the time. So anybody remember which of the vitamins are fat soluble or lipid soluble? So there's, there's an acronym I always think of ADEC, A-D-E-K, vitamins A, vitamins D, E, and K are all fat soluble vitamins. So if you if you're drinking mineral oil around the time you're eating food or taking your vitamins, those vitamins will stick in the mineral oil and won't get absorbed. 
So there's a whole bunch of issues. If somebody you know is like, it's usually an old older person thing, they're like, I grew up on mineral oil. I'm like, great. Maybe you should use something newer that's not going to cause <laughs> anal itching. Uh, here's a great option. This is probably my go-to option for anybody on constipation. They are just about as potent. Uh, well, they're, 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 they're highly effective. They kick in relatively quick. This can take a couple of days to really start working, but it's not nearly as, as, uh, aggressive as like the saline osmotics, like the uh, mag citrate that we had and that kind of stuff. Um, they are, uh, in particular, the Miralax is a great option. These, these uh, uh, hyperosmotic, where it's, it's like a powder, you mix it with liquid, whatever you want, you drink it down, and it draws li uh, liquid to it, stays in the gut, and it moves things along, but it's a lot more gentle than something like a, the saline osmotics. The glycerin suppositories um, are something that are used usually in little babies that can't take medicine by mouth, and they're pretty long. You should look at them and be like, whoa, kids' colons are actually straight. And as you get older, as an adult, your colon gets that little kink in the end of it. So adult suppositories are a lot shorter than baby suppositories, which just seems backwards, but that's that's what we got. Um, the, uh, the suppositories for the glycerin basically uh, uh, draws liquid to it. It also irritates the, the tissue and the, the mucosal tissue in the colon. And that causes more secretions from the tissue. And so it's kind of a one-two punch of some irritation potentially, but uh, it moves things along pretty quick. And if you've got a constipated baby, uh, it, it does the trick. It's, they're not the most fun to you know, administer. Thank you. I was going to say insert, but you guys get the idea. Uh, one of the last options is a stimulant. So these... Do, do, do. I don't know if I have anything. I don't have any of these. Stimulants are ones that actually increase the contraction of the of the muscles in the colon and kind of either increase the frequency or the, the strength of those contractions to move stuff through your colon more quickly. Um, you can get cramps from these because your muscles are working harder. Uh, and you can potentially get an electrolyte imbalance if they work too well and they're pushing stuff in so quick that you uh, so quickly that you can't absorb electrolytes uh, or nutrients correctly. So these can be kind of like abused uh, in a way. Um, but bisacodyl or Senna are the kind of the main options here uh, to kind of move things along. And then lastly, we have combo products that combine the stimulant we were just looking at with the emollient, like the stool softener. And you kind of do a your, uh, we call it mush and push is the, the term. So the emollient mushes it up and the stimulant pushes it through. Uh, and then you keep people regular in that regard. So, uh, oh, and last but not least, I forgot, I added the RX option. So these are highly potent drugs that stimulate fluid secretion in the intestines. And uh, a couple of these options, the two left hand, Lin Linzess and Trulance, they can also stimulate transit too. So they're kind of stimulating the muscle contraction through. Um, there's potential for some no, no fun side effects, but, uh, and these are really only used in real severe cases and, and not, not very commonly prescribed. But if you see any of these on a patient's profile, you know they've, uh, they're dealing with some some pretty severe GI issues. When it comes to dental hygiene, if you guys are, I know the, the trend I think now is to, is to rely more heavily on, on NSAIDs like ibuprofen and things like that for pain relief after dental procedures. But if you're seeing, if you're seeing narcotics go out to patients, make sure that they are warned about um, constipation as a side effect and to take uh, preventative measures like stool softeners, stay hydrated, all that kind of stuff. Maybe the Miralax, just to get someone on that on board for the period of time that they're taking uh, the narcotics. Um, if they do have constipation, again, maybe semi-supine might help. Uh, questions on constipation before we do a lightning round of diarrhea. <laughs> yes? Have you ever heard that um, eating like high, high levels of vitamin C Constipation. High, high levels of vitamin C causing constipation. I haven't heard that, but um, vitamin C is, so it's not a fat soluble one. It's uh, generally, if you take too much of a vitamin, your body just 
gets rid of it. Uh, and, and that, you know, you would just pee it out uh, and only absorb what, you, what your body needs and the rest goes out the stool. I mean, I, I hadn't heard about that. I suppose it's possible though, for sure. It kind of depends on what else is maybe mixed in with that vitamin C. Um, um, but yeah, that's an interesting one. So with con diarrhea, we've got the opposite problem of constipation. Things aren't moving through too slow. They're moving through too quick. Or we're getting, ex uh, or there's excessive fluid in this uh, stool because of uh, ions going into this, um, into the stool that are pulling water with them. So, um, and drugs can contribute to this if they speed the, the uh, speed up the process of moving food through. You can get chronic diarrhea from laxative misuse or lactose intolerance, bowel disease, all kinds of issues. Uh, lots of different things can cause, um, can cause diarrhea. There aren't a lot of options. There's a couple, there's one sort of prescription option, Lamotil, that's a, that basically works the same way a narcotic does to slow down the contractions of the intestine, but it's like 50 times more potent than morphine just in terms of the, the, the intestinal slowing effect. So uh, it's, a, and they actually, it's combined uh, it's that it's that kind of drug that works like a narcotic, but they also combine it with an anticholinergic drug, uh, in which we talked about earlier is the ones that make you can't shit, slows things down, right? Uh, and so that it's a kind of a one-two punch. So very potent stuff uh, for that. Uh, over the counter, we've got Imodium, uh, the anti-diarrheal, and um, and that also works similarly to kind of slow down contractions and all that stuff. Uh, and then. Pepto is, uh, is approved for anti-diarrheal, and they think, again, it's because it kind of decreases secretions in the gut, uh, so it can kind of help dry things out, but it's not super, um, super effective in that regard. Uh, so there's that prescription-only option that where you've got the diphenoxalate that's decreasing peristalsis. Um, uh, it, it, oh, they also mix it with atropine to kind of keep people from abusing this drug. So uh, people, since it is kind of chemically related to like a narcotic, you could take it and feel great if you did too much of it uh, potentially. So they put in atropine to make you feel, it, it kind of helps a little bit with the, it's an anticholinergic, so it helps with the can't uh, poop thing, but it also makes you feel pretty crummy when you are like, dry mouth and your eyes are blurry and you can't go to the bathroom and or can't pee and everything. So it's a, it, they use it as a deterrent to abuse, which is kind of interesting. It also has a laundry list of uh, side effects, uh, most applicable of which is gingival hyperplasia as a potential, pr pretty rare, but um, this is the reason it's prescription is because of all the, is the potential for abuse and all of those side effects. Uh, the OTC product can cause some dry mouth, which would be of, uh, of significance to y'all, but um, otherwise not too bad of stuff. It is slowing the intestinal transit and giving the uh, stool time to dry out the way it should be. Um, and then bismuth, again, we're, we're not sure exactly how it works, but probably the anti-secretory effect. Still got that black stool or tongue issue that's harmless. And we talked about all of that earlier. So hopefully if someone's got uncontrolled diarrhea, they're not coming in to see you and sit in the chair for an hour. Uh, if they do, maybe you need to come up with like a safe word or something um, to get them out of the chair quickly. But um, yeah, that is basically it. Questions at this point? Yes. So did you say if someone's taking that like morphine, 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 morphine? Yeah, if you're if someone's on a, a narcotic, a, a pain medication like a like a morphine or a Percocet or a hydrocodone, oxycodone, any of that kind of stuff, those are definitely going to slow down the transit of stool through the gut. They slow down those contractions and stuff. And so you want to take something like a stool softener or get them on like a Miralax, a polyethylene glycol powder that'll they can take kind of routinely to, uh, while they're taking this the, the narcotic just to prevent constipation because. If they take the narcotic for more than a, like a couple of days, they're going to get constipated if they don't do something else. I mean, unless they're like super hydrated and active, you know, and if someone's on a pain med, they're probably not active. And anyway, 
I did have another mini case, but I think we're going to skip it since we are at time. Main take home points semi supine chair position, maybe needed if people got GI issues going on. And when in doubt, look it up. Um, you, can, you can use all the resources at your disposal or just your good old uh, phone. Uh, I mean, are you guys aware of like some of the drug references you can get through this? Pacific Library. Lexicomp. So there's Lexicomp. We can also, you can get an app on your phone through Micromedics. Uh, if you go onto the drug databases, go to Micromedics and like into the lower, on, log in on, on like a laptop. And in the lower right hand corner of the Micromedics homepage, there's a little download apps button. You click on that and you can get a drug reference app. You can get a drug interactions app. There's a couple of pediatric apps on there as well that are all. You got an iPhone and Android versions. And there's a little code on that screen that you have to plug into the app every six months to maintain your access. And that's but from the, through the library? Through the library, yeah. So you can go in and the drug reference app can be helpful for because you can quickly look up side effects and, and things like that. Um, and it's right there in your pocket and it's free while you're students. You might as well take advantage. Uh, any other questions before? Wrap it up just a couple minutes late. Apologies for that. Okay, well, right. thank you. Thanks, so folks. Much. That's awesome information. And then I'll get the new PowerPoint up and the recording up on Moodle as well. Thank sure. you. So awesome. Thank you so much, you so much yeah, for coming you. in. Yeah, good. Oh, you're good. They're, they might even start it. Catch late because I see the UIS is here. So. Oh.